it's Cadian. Uh, you thought Acadian was just uh, some kind of uh, thing they came up with to make that one movie that had the rock in it. Apparently there was a group of folks called the Acadian. Take a look at Habakkuk real quick. It's only a three-chapter book. Let me give you a brief rundown of it. First four verses basically have an introduction and uh, a complaint that Habakkuk is going to uh, launch and talk about. Then God is going to answer his prayer in verses 5 through 11. And then Habakkuk is going to ask another question. And this is different. Most of the prophets are speaking for God. That's the definition of a prophet. One who speaks for God. You know, one who speaks for another is the, the Hebrew nubai, nubai. And so here we have a, it's totally different. The prophet's actually talking to God and God responds. And Habakkuk's just not happy at all with his first response. Uh, because Habakkuk's uh, complaint is, you know, look how sorry we are. As a nation, we're, we're people, we don't appreciate you. How long are you going to put up with this? And God's like, hey, it's good, I got plans. I'm fixing to slam you guys with this nation called the Chaldeans. And Habakkuk's like, whoa, wait a minute, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, while they're pagans, they worship the very instruments of war they use. He says, you know, how, how can you do that? And so God will take up uh, the answer. Uh, he'll ask that in verses 12 through about verse 3 or 4 of the next chapter. Then in chapter 2, beginning with verse 4, he's going to give, or verse 5, he's going to give five woes. And he's going to talk about just wait and see. Here's what I'm going to do. And so God answers Habakkuk's second complaint. And then the third one is basically a, a poem, a song, if you will, written by Habakkuk, praising God for uh, his great wisdom. And then the last few verses there you're going to have. Uh, so that, that's the book of Habakkuk. I had uh, made a plan that years ago I wanted to preach on at least three uh, prophets, minor prophets, a year. And I got to looking through uh, my notes, and uh, I keep a list of the sermons and what I talk about. And it's been ten years since we have visited the book of Habakkuk. Can you believe that? Uh, so I wanted to spend some time with it. It's an ancient book with current questions. How come everything's so bad? Why is everything so awful? Why are these sorry people, you know, killing each other? And why is, you know, all this wickedness looked at as being good? And that's Habakkuk's question. And remember, he's writing 500 years before the Christ, you know. It's, a, oh, maybe 600 years. A seventh century is what most folks think. That'd be 600, 601, 602, and so forth. So it's an old book, but current questions. And the questions the prophet has is, you know, some we might have today. Is God indifferent? Does he not care? Is he not looking at what's going on around here? Is God inactive? He just sits, is, are the deists right? Did God just kind of wind it up and let it go? And then his third question, is God inconsistent? Is he going to use this bunch of sorry folks over here to punish us? What's up with that? And so well, those are questions that we could even, why do the wicked prosper? You know, living, you know, why do bad people prosper living so wicked year after year? A couple of things before we keep rolling here. Let me back up for just a moment. Got some sick folks. Susie Wilson, not here tonight. She's not, she woke up not feeling good. And uh, also Elijah, who had intended, he was going to Georgia to visit his girlfriend. Well, boy, that all came off the wheels. Uh, he's sick, and she said, don't come. <laughs> and so <laughs> he's at home and uh, not feeling well. And, uh, and so we've got several that, that are out with sickness. And uh, poor old uh, Megan, how many surgeries is this for you now? 300, 400? She's having her head removed tomorrow, and they're going to try a new one and see how it fits. And, uh, but no, seriously, she's having another dental surgery, and Stephanie's getting some stuff done tomorrow, going to get some stitches out and some more skin cancer. So remember us in your prayers, and remember all those. I was talking to some of the members before we started tonight. We've got to come up with a new rule. You're welcome to use my DVR. Come over to my house. But if your favorite college football team plays after 9 o'clock on a Saturday night, you need to tape it. All right? This morning, I did everything I could to give you all some energy, and you had none. You just could not give me anything back. And so, uh, seriously, though, the book survey, we talked about first four questions. Back at struggle with Judah being just sorry. God's going to answer uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 12 through 2, 1, Habakkuk struggled because God's using these wicked folks to punish Judah. God's going to answer again. Habakkuk understands God's justice and universal judgment. And so then we have his uh, triumph resolution there at the end of the book. Four great lessons from the book of Habakkuk. God is absolute sovereign. 
Don't ever forget that. God's in control. That's what the book of Habakkuk is about. We may question God. We may say, why does God do the things that he does? But Habakkuk says, at the end of the day, remember, God's in control. Daniel, God raises up kingdoms. God brings down kingdoms. God's in control. His time frame is not like ours. We'll look at this in just a moment. But he is the absolute sovereign. Sovereign means the king. Nobody, he doesn't answer to anybody. God is absolute. Number two, faithfulness to God assures safety. The just shall live by faith, as Paul will quote in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, is a quote from the second part of verse 4 of chapter 2. The just shall live by faith. Divine discipline, guaranteed. Folks, it's going to happen. You look out there at the wicked folks, you say, why do they prosper? How come it seems everything goes their way? Don't worry about it. God is going to take care of it. And here you think about the time that we have, 60, 70, 80 years maybe in this life. Uh, three score and ten by reason of strength four think about eternity God is going to take care of it folks are not going to get past God's discipline and tranquility think about this brethren if you don't take anything else from this lesson take this with you in the middle of a mess no matter how bad it is you can find some tranquility remember what Paul would say in whatsoever state I'm in learned how to be what content to be content, be happy with whatever the situation is. And not happy as in, wee, I'm getting beaten, you know. But happy in the sense that you know the end result. And you can take joy in that. Think about Revelations chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. Now, Revelations chapter 6, verses 10 and 11 is not teaching something different than Luke chapter 16 or what Brother Blackwell talked about. Uh, how some will say that, you know... Uh, the soul goes to sleep. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that souls are very much alive. As a matter of fact, it doesn't even look like we lose consciousness from the time that we die till we wake up in the world of the spirits, the Hadean realm. But in Revelation chapter 6, you have the heads, you have the beheaded saints under the altar, and they're crying, How long, Lord? How long? Folks, that's not real people. That's not a real situation where you have some folks that are in Hades raising up their voice, what you have there is the idea of God's justice and His long-suffering. You know, uh, do you remember when uh, Jesus said if the works, that had, he's, he's getting after Tyre and Sidon, those two uh, Phoenician cities that were so wealthy and popular, he says, you know, if the mighty works that had been done in you had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, what did he say about them? They would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes, wouldn't they? But he says, you will, you will not. Bethsaida and so forth. He gets after them. Uh, what you have here is the justice of God. At some point in time, uh, you know, and I've heard preachers preach this. I know you have too. At what point is God going to have to apologize to Sodom for the great wickedness that's taking place in our nation when we're doing the very same things they were doing? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to, I'm pretty sure I didn't put this on the screen. I did not. Let's turn to Isaiah. There will be two places we'll go. This will be one of them. The other one will be Psalm 77. But let's go to Isaiah right now. Isaiah is going to be talking about himself. And actually he's talking about the Messiah. But he's going to be using uh, first person. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 50. And let's look at verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> Isaiah 50 verse 9 and 10. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lo, they all shall wax old as a gar garment. The moth shall eat them up. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. In other words, when you can't figure out why things are going the way they are, this is talking about the Messiah, by the way. What, he is, what he's saying there is trust in God. Have faith that God is going to get you through whatever predicament it is that you're in. Notice this uh, poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. This is the whole poem. It's only four lines. It's called Retribution. When we sing that song about why do the wicked prosper year after year, you know, living so wicked year after year, why is that? Think about this poem that Wadsworth wrote. It says, though the mills of God grind slowly. We like things to happen fast, don't we? We won't, hey... This guy killed this person. He needs to pay for that. I mean, that even is a Bible principle, by the way. Ecclesiastes chapter 80, verse 11, it says, Because a sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, 
the hearts of men are set to do evil continually. In other words, uh, if you kill somebody and you get a life sentence or you get capital punishment, you're going to be put to death for murder. How long will you live from that date? On average, about, I think it's 22 years in this country, if you even have a state that has capital punishment. And so there's a principle there, but we like things to happen on our time. And that's what Habakkuk's problem is here. But notice what Longfellow writes. He says, though the mills of God grind slowly, yet they grind exceeding small. In other words, nothing. You don't have to worry about breaking your tooth on a big kernel. It really grinds it up. Though with patience, this is God, he stands waiting with exactness, grinds he all. In other words, people that are evil, folks that mistreat, folks that are ugly, Folks that are not Christians, folks that do not obey God, it may look like they're having a great time now. You may even be mistaken in thinking they've got it easier than you, as we see in Psalms, uh, one of the Psalms. But that's not the case, and, and it definitely will not be the case uh, in the hereafter. Notice Habakkuk 1.1, 1, 1, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. Notice he calls himself a prophet. Good chance he's probably a professional prophet. The word burden, it means a, a, lo a load, if you will. Something, a song, singing about a great war, a work or great weight to be born. His name is believed to mean embrace, but man, there's uh, when it comes to Hebrew names, if you ever do a word study on those, and you'll see three or four definitions, some of them won't even be in the same ballpark as uh, some other names. Now, there are names like Elijah or Elisha, names like that. Those are pretty easy. Those are pretty much across the board. You can rest assured what they mean. But for a lot of them, like Habakkuk, we even said that... Uh, it's not of Hebrew origin. Nobody knows where he comes from unless the two times you talk about the book where his name's mentioned, he's not mentioned anywhere else. But it seems that he's a, a professional prophet. What do I mean by that? He's, he's called a prophet, calls himself a prophet. He's in, in Jerusalem writing. So probably a professional preacher. That's what he does. That's his livelihood. That's wakes up every day and preaches and teaches and, and writes and so forth. Verse 2, O Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou will not hear. Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou will not save. Things, bad things are happening to me, God. Are you not paying any attention? One of my favorite psalms, one of the ones that I put to memory early, and you, you'll notice some similarities between Psalms 13, Psalms 15, Psalms 24. These are all heavy worship uh, psalms where the psalmist is like, God, I'm pouring out my heart to you. Are you not paying attention? Are, are you not listening to me? Do you not see my tears? Do you not feel how I feel? You can read Habakkuk's words here. He's crying to thee of violence. Bad things are happening to me. It hurts. People are being violent. And thou will not save. Reminds me of Psalms 13, verse 1, when David says, How long will thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long will thou... Hide thy face from me. In other words, you're not, you're not looking at me. You're not paying attention to me. In verse 3, he'll go on and say, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. There are people that are trying to kill me. That's how bad the situation is in Psalms 13. And, of course, David's asking, How long are you going to let this go on? Habakkuk continues in verse 3. <coughs> it says, Why dost thou show me iniquity? In other words, why is this in my face? You know, I remember... Uh, talking with a, a friend of mine, he, uh, David B. Smith, y'all would know him. We were talking about our uh, Army experiences. By the way, he and I have always encouraged young people, don't go that route, if at all possible. Like uh, Brother uh, Don, sorry, Joe, you know how it is, though, right? It's, uh, yeah. Uh, Don Blackwell, you know, uh, he was in the Air Force, in the intelligence community in the Air Force, and he says it's a bad place. You can imagine what combat arms would be like. And... Uh, and one thing that he said that just really stuck out to me, and I thought, you know, I never thought about that, but that's absolutely right, is he says, I can't change the things that I saw. And I can't change the things that I heard. Now, he's not talking about war. He's talking about just ungodly things, evil things. Uh, brethren, when you go to basic training, any anytime there's a military post, you're going to have a, a group around that military post that prey on uh, young men, 17, 18, 19. Everything from alcohol, drugs, prostitution, violence. <coughs> There's going to be all of that uh, represented there. 
And I'll never forget, he said, the things that I saw and things that I heard, I'll never be able to get that from my mind. That's what Habakkuk's saying here. He goes, I go to work every day. I work at the temple maybe, you know, in the temple area. I'm in Jerusalem. I'm in the holy city. And he says, look at all this around me, the iniquity that I've had to look at and cause me to behold grievance. For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Nobody's happy. Everybody's fighting. They're arguing. Look at all this that's going on. Habakkuk says, God, how long am I going to have to see this? Why do I have to see this? Why won't you do something? Why won't you make these evil people quit being evil? Why don't you make the people that are killing people and stealing from folks and taking people and oppressing them, why don't you stop them? That's his complaint. Verse 4, it says, Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth come pass about the righteous. Folks, have you, have you listened to what's going on, the news and stuff? If you're like me, you probably don't listen to a whole lot of it, but occasionally I like to watch the weather, and sometimes you catch what's on the front end and on the back end of it. And you cannot tell what's true. You've got these folks standing in front of the camera. This uh, car is gray and ran over this man. And then on the other channel, they'll have this man slammed his face into this car, and he's green. You know, and you're looking at the same stuff, and there's two different sides to it, and you can't make heads or tails out of any of it. The wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. It seems like the people with the power and the money, they just make things up and make things happen. And we're seeing it happen in front of our faces today. You can't tell me what the truth is because you don't know, and you know what? I don't either. And so what am I doing? I guess I'm like an ostrich. I'm just burying my head in the sand and hoping that people will work it out. The law is slack. Would anybody say that our country is a law-abiding place? I mean, would folks say, you know, for the average most people in business and in government, they're trying to do what's right for the people, they're trying to do what's right for the economy, or are they trying to do what's right for themselves? Well, I think most of us can get the picture of what's happening here. And we see it, and we want to change it, and yet folks say, well, I haven't done anything wrong. You know, well, what's the debt? That's what I'm back at saying. <laughs> He's saying the same thing. And remember, this is 2,600 years ago. So we ought to find some comfort in the fact that this has been going on. And guess what? Long after me and you are gone, it's still going to be going on. So we can find some tranquility, realize and recognize. And we can be like Habakkuk. It's nothing wrong with a little righteous indignation from time to time. And saying, God, why is it like this? And then we study a book like Habakkuk. We look at Job and we say, you know what? God's in charge. We look at Daniel where you had all these kingdoms are fighting each other and killing. You know, Babylonians are... Medial persons are destroying them. You're going to have the Greeks that are going to come through. They're going to rule the world. And guess what God says? I'm in charge and I'm here and you're going to be okay. And what's going on around you might be a mess, but you be faithful. I'm, I'm going to take care of you. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. The dangers of despair. Let's notice when if we allow this to get to us, first of all, destroys. We'll just go with these as we go through them. Destroys. Despair destroys faith in God. Think about Samuel. Samuel. Saul had gotten to a point where he listened to David's enemies. He listened to people who wanted to be in, in Saul's pocket telling him, this guy's no good for you. Look at there, those ladies are singing those songs. And he was, he was always looking over his shoulder. He got what's called uh, paranoid. You ever known people like that? They're scared to death. They're upset. They're, they'll, they'll eyeball you because they think you're trying to get something from them. And you're not trying to do anything. But they become paranoid. And this is what happened with King Saul. Remember, it got so bad that he went to the witch at Endor. And he, people that he had run out and said, you can't even do this anymore, he went to them to ask for advice. He wanted to talk to Samuel. Too bad he didn't listen to Samuel more when Samuel was on this side of uh, the grave. Well, he's defeated at Mount Gilbo, and it wasn't because his army, it wasn't because he couldn't have defeated them had God been with him. But he had grown into despair. He was depressed, depressed and discouraged. Nothing like uh, take an army down quicker than bad leadership. Uh, it, it'll, it'll bring you. Anybody ever heard of Braxton Bragg? That's my point. <laughs> Anybody ever heard of Custer? <laughs> uh, <laughs> even took Jonathan down with him. One reason we pray for our leaders is we want them to have courage and do what's right. Notice it encourages strife, despair encourages strife, quarrels, bitterness. 
look at our nation today. Would you say that we're happy with each other in America? I've never seen America so torn apart. It did hurts my soul. It hurts me to see our country so mad at our, oh, wait a minute, our country. <laughs> Who are we mad at? Us. I don't even like us, you know. <laughs> it's amazing how upset we are. Israel had been warned, they'd been told, Deuteronomy 28, 65, among these nations thou will find no ease. Neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest, but the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. When they left God, they left all. Despair surrenders victory. Those in despair cannot trust in the victory that comes by trusting in God's power. Jeremiah 8, 20, the harvest is past, the summer is ended. We're not saved. Why not? Because you didn't save you. You didn't do anything. Psalms 31, 22a, for I said in my haste, I will cut off before, from before thine eyes. Notice that. The psalmist says, I said in my haste, I was in a hurry, jumped into conclusions, I am cut off from before God's eyes, if you will, from thine eyes. But then, nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. God does hear us. The psalmist will immediately, right there in the same verse, does a flip-flop, a 180. So you did hear me. Proverbs 24.10 says, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Just like Jesus said, you know, will I find faith when I return? Winston Churchill, I guess he is the epitome of victory, isn't he? He took a nation, the great uh, nation of uh, Britain that was on its knees, and he guided it through that. He went to a place called Harrow Prep School. Uh, and, of course, uh, you can't help, I, I love Winston Churchill. I uh, actually uh, had to listen to, I wanted to read one of his books one time, but I needed to listen to it. It was, it was a difficult book. But he went to this Harrow Prep School, and after serving in the military and in politics where he guided England through World War II, serving two terms as prime minister and then basically was run out of town on a pole, uh, he was invited to speak at Harrow. Going back to this prep school, can you imagine? I mean, that would be like having uh, Trump or Bush or Reagan or uh, the president of the United States come and speak where he used to go to school. It's a big deal. Invited to speak at Harrow. And you know what he says? <laughs> Eight words. Eight words. Goes back to his old school. He says, young gentlemen, there's two of them. Never, 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 never give up. And he went and sat down. <laughs> Plenty of time for popcorn after that one, right? This speech is famous for its brevity, and it's a secret to winning. That was his thing. I love this quote by him. It says, success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. Remember that saying of uh, 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 Vince Lombardi talking to his, uh, his football team? You know, I, I like old Vince Lombardi's stories. You know, Bill Curry, who, by the way, was an Alabama head coach at one time, y'all ran him off. He went 12-1. and one. They threw a brick through his window. <laughs> so he left and actually went to Kentucky. Was, he's uh, spent some time here in Chattanooga, the Baylor um, Anyway, I'm a big Bill, Bill Curry fan. He played center for the Green Bay Packers. And one of Lombardi's quotes is, you will be fired with enthusiasm. In other words, fired up. Or you will be fired with enthusiasm. <laughs> In other words, you're going to be enthusiastic as a Green Bay Packer, or you're going to be fired into, with, uh, with enthusiasm. I remember Bill Curry said, Vince Lombardi had three rules, three in order of how you were going to live your life. You had God. You had family, and you had the Green Bay Packers. And he said, and sometimes during practice, I just know he messed some of them up because it sure didn't seem like uh, God and family was there. But uh, enjoy uh, quotes like that, men that en encourage us to, from failure to failure, without loss of enthusiasm, time and time again. Dunkirk, think about that. The entire British Army is uh, cut off. They're going to die. I mean, it's over with. What, what are they going to fight with? And they're able through canoes and rafts and <laughs> boats to rescue 200 and about a quarter of a million men. That was something. Despair places blame on God. When despair controls our emotions, we have a tendency to, God did it. Isn't that what Job did? Notice Job 9, verse 17. For he breaketh me with a tempest and multiplieth my wounds without cause. Was that true? No, as a matter of fact, God was holding the leash. The Satan was the one that was... Uh, breaking him with a tempest and multiplying his wounds without cause. Job didn't know that. You know what? When he got a chance to talk to God, God didn't explain himself. God didn't explain himself. Psalm 77. If you turn there with me, 
I asked you a moment ago, I want you to read this psalm with me. It's a, it's a beautiful psalm. We won't read the whole thing. But it says, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my boy, voice, and he gave ear unto me. In the day of trouble, I sought the Lord. Reminds me of a song. Notice uh, Psalm 17, 8. This is up on the screen. Don't lose your place there. Psalm 17, 8. Keep me as the apple of thy eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Well, I'm having some space issues on some of these, aren't I? How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God, Psalms 36, 7. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Protection. Remember how Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you as a hen would gather her chicks. You know, but you would not. Psalms 57, 1. Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee, yea, in the shadow of thy wings. I will make my refuge. Psalm 63, verse 7, Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. You catch a theme there? There's a song in our song books that we sing sometimes. You want to sing it with me? Let's do it. It's an echo song, okay? So let me turn this microphone off because it will be bad if I do not. All right? You ready? these wonderful teachings that we find in the book of Psalms. Notice he says in verse 7, Will the Lord cast off forever? Here we are again. That's that same thing. Habakkuk had it. Job's at it. Will he cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? In his mercy clean gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercy? You see that word salah there? That means just moment of quietness rest it's going to change it all God just going to forgive us verse 10 and I said wait a minute this is my infirmity this is my problem but I will remember the years of thy right hand of the most high I will remember the works of the Lord surely I will remember the wonders of old think about how the Jews 
uh, this morning in our Sunday school class, how they could look back on the crossing of the Red Sea. God made a path when obviously there was no path to be had. When God tells us today, there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God will, with the temptation, make a means of escape. You see, God is there for us. The psalmist says, I need to remember that. I need to think about how Israel of old could remember. Look, God made a way. I will meditate also on thy work and talk of thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the peoples. How many times do we even see in the New Testament when the people would stop for a minute and thank God for what had been happening, be it Peter being released or whatever the situation was, and they would talk about the God of heaven and what he had done for Israel and how he had saved his people. When Paul would talk to the pagans, what did he talk to them about? God made this, the heavens and the earth and all that is in them is. God has made this. Think of the wonderful and the gratefulness of God. Verse 15, Thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people, the son of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw thee, O God, the waters saw thee. They were afraid, and the depths also were troubled. Why? Because God can separate the waters. He can remove the waters. The clouds pour out water. The skies send out a sound. Thine arrows also went abroad. That's all I wanted us to see out of Psalm 77 there, though he's wrestling with the same question that Habakkuk's wrestling with. All the good gifts, Habakkuk was unable to see what was happening because of his despair, his upsetness with God, the way things were going. James 1.17 says every gift, every good gift and perfect gift is from above. He couldn't see that. Always sees the negative. That's what despair does. Habakkuk looked around and all he could see was bad. He could not see the great wonders that God was accomplishing through the Chaldeans. There was a story, it is a story, it's a tale, it's written down, it's history. I wish I could remember. There was a king, and he asked, he said, how do we know that there's a God, you know, the God of heaven? Not that he didn't believe in God, he was just saying, what's an evidence that I can, and one of his little, whatever the people are that it's in his court, said, uh, sir, the, the Jews. And the king was like, what do you mean? He says, never before in the history of the world has a nation been completely removed <clears throat> from where it lived and then 50, 60, 70 years later be brought back, reestablished, and the Habakkuk doesn't see that. He didn't, but he does see that. He's asking God, why is everything so messed up? We're awful. We've got a temple to God right here. There's a temple to Zeus over there. There's the Baal gods over here. There's all this wickedness, paganism going on. Jeremiah's dealing with the same thing. All the prophets, they're saying, get these, these idols away. God has said, I'm going to deliver the Messiah. I'm going to do it with the Jews. And yet they're as pagan as everybody else. So what does he do? He ends it forever. How does he do that? He brings in the Chaldeans. He brings in the Assyrians, gets rid of the northern kingdoms, brings in the Chaldeans, they take them to Babylon. God said, you want, put, you, want, you want idols? Have an idol. And he takes them to a place just like India today where if you turn a corner, you're going to see an idol on every corner. And when they came back from that captivity, you know how much problems they had with idols? Zero. They were purged of that. Habakkuk can't see that. He, wants to, he even questions God, how can you use these Chaldeans to do that? He doesn't see that God is going to purge the Jews of this problem so that indeed he can bring the Messiah that he's promised to bring through their lineage. Habakkuk doesn't see that. All he sees is the bad. He could not see God keeping the nation of Israel on track to deliver the Messiah. He said God's word was ignored and viewed with contempt. He thought God's word had become ineffective. He didn't remember that God says, you know, by the way, Isaiah, Isaiah writes before Habakkuk, he says, my word's not going to return to me void. And brethren, that's something we need to remember. God's word is not going to return to him void. It's going to do exactly what it's done, what he wants it to do. Notice uh, it says there, it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. God says, my word's doing exactly what I'm telling it to do, what I've told you to do with it. We're not careful. As Christians, we can forget this principle. Sometimes we get discouraged thinking nobody's listening. God says, go into all the world, preach the gospel. 
Matthew's account says, Go ye therefore and teach all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We think nobody's listening. God says you preach it. Well, nobody's paying any. It's good for you. You need to preach it. Because why? It is the power of God unto salvation. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. You say, look, it's not having any effect. Uh, don't you know that's what people in Rome were saying? Don't you know that's what people in uh, Babylon, where the Jews in Babylon were saying? But it did exactly what God wanted it to do, and it will continue to do that. We have to remind ourselves of that, or we'll get hung up in the, well, I'm not doing any good, I'm just going to quit idea. It was a man who had been an active member of the Lord's church, became unfaithful, and asked why. He said he saw brethren who were not what they were supposed to be. Brethren, I've watched this with my own eyes. Went to a man's funeral not long ago. He quit the church. He simply quit going. I love that man. And his problem was brethren. He says brethren aren't what they're supposed to be. Well, have brethren ever been what they're supposed to be? I mean, is my hope in... In you? Is your hope and trust and faith in me? Now, don't get me wrong. I want to do right. I want to be a good example. But I'm not the person you need to be following unless I'm following Christ. You know, sometimes I think that we have so much confidence in brethren and then when we're let down, folks, you're not going to have a hero in the church that you're not going to find a flaw in. I used to think Foy Wallace hung the moon. Still do. I like Foy Wallace. I love to read his writing. But Brother Wallace had some problems. You know, he, uh, he taught some things that I don't think are quite right. Uh, you're going to find that with everybody. <laughs> but then again, we look at the Bible, and who do we see? Abraham, father of the faithful. Was Abraham everything he needed to be? Well, Abraham had a problem lying, didn't he? We think about David. Why, he's a man after God's own heart. You can't get any better than David. Did David have any problems? He sure did. So when we look at it, where is our faith supposed to be? He said he lost faith in his brethren. Our faith is not to be in the brethren. Our faith is to be in God. Now there's a two-edged deal here. I'm not saying that we shouldn't love our brethren, that we shouldn't try to encourage each other, that we shouldn't be everything that we should be to try to uphold and uplift and be an example to our brethren. I'm not saying that at all. We need to do that. But brethren, don't put your soul salvation in my ability to do what's right. You put it in God's ability. God's going to do right. God is always going to do right. Our faith's not in the brethren. It's in the Lord. I've seen that happen. As far as I, I know, as far as the information I have, that man died lost. He just decided he'd have church at home. Well, you can't assemble with the saints on the, day, the first day of the week and do the things you need to do if you're not with them. Despair insists upon now. You know, apparently Habakkuk had been praying for a long time. He wanted God to act on his timetable. Well, that's not what happened. Notice in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 18, 11, Now therefore go to speak to the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. But notice, stop. Now, return ye now. What's God saying? I've got this plan. And he's saying, If you don't straighten up, I'm going to lower the boom on you. But he says, If you return... From his evil way and make your ways good and your doings good. And what do they say? There's no hope. Forget it. <laughs> we will walk after our own devices. What are they saying? It's too late. What did God say? If you'll return. Look at the passport. Return ye now. But they've done say, nope. No hope. It's too late. Well, that's not the case. God and Jeremiah is trying to tell them that. And they won't listen. We'll walk after our own devices, and we will everyone do the imagination of his evil heart. Last but not least, despair ruins all future hope. Think about it. Habakkuk did not believe anything good can come from the situation that he's experiencing. Uh, any hope of a better situation was lost. Proverbs 13, 12 says, Hope deferred, make it the heart sick. If somebody loses hope, you've seen it. If you've worked around a hospital, visited people in the hospital, You've seen people who at some point just say, you know, I'm, I'm done. You, know, you can tell it in their actions. You can tell it. And that's not always a bad thing. I think uh, sometimes we're done. You know, <laughs> Sometimes we're ready to go. I remember a good friend of mine talking about the death of a, 
of a close loved one. And when he got to the hospital, uh, you, the man was really having a hard time living, you know, breathing and so forth. And, and uh, one of the professionals there said, you know, sometimes people fight, you know, they don't, you, you need to tell him it's okay. It's okay to go. And, of course, this person did that, and almost immediately the man breathed his last breath. He just, well, he was fighting for other folks. But when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life, you know, when there's, when there's hope. The idea we cannot see like God. That's something we need to remember, brethren, and it's hard because we're living this life and we see these things going on and we try to process it, you know, with what we know from Scripture. God's going to take care of it. We don't see the big picture. God's thoughts are not our thoughts, neither His ways our ways, saith the Lord. But the heavens are higher. God knows all these things. Think of the story of Job. Job is written. All 40-plus chapters are written so that you can see that Job is totally confused about what's going through, but God's in control, and God is taking care of Satan, and God is helping Job even though he can't figure that out. Do you see the big picture? We can look at Job and we can see, you know what, I don't understand everything, but I do understand that I just simply need to be faithful. God answers prayer. Notice verse 5. God's going to answer Habakkuk. He says, Behold ye among the heathen. I kind of like the NIV here a little bit. I know it troubles me to say that. But I like how they've translated this passage. Notice, Behold ye among the heathen and regard and wonder marvelously. Well, look at the nations. He's saying, You look at the world around you and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if it were told you. What's he doing? He is going to bring in a nation who is going to capture Judah and is going to take them into captivity and then years later bring them back. Nobody believed that. Never been done before. Never been done since as far as I know. Because even if you were told, you wouldn't know. Brethren, salvation's in the Christ. We think of the plan of salvation. We think about how God would have us to be saved. This is something God's given us. We may not all understand all the component parts and how everything applies, you know, to uh, how God works that. You know, I don't understand everything that's involved with baptism, but that doesn't mean I can't surrender to it. It doesn't mean that I understand that when I'm baptized, God cleanses me. And through the faith of the operation of God, He does something that takes away my sins. I don't understand every aspect of it but like Habakkuk I can simply trust God God's going to do the right thing God tells me to do this it's for a reason and I just simply comply and God is going to bless me as a result maybe you're here this evening you've never obeyed the gospel why not why not go ahead and do what God would have you to do he's not trying to trick you it's not something he's trying to pull the wool over your eyes he's saying I'm in charge here is my what I want you to do submit to my will Jesus would say, ye that are troubled, you know, rest. You know, come, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden. Uh, Paul would tell the Thessalonians, those who are troubled, rest with us. Obedience to the gospel. Trust in God, and he'll save you. If there's anything we can do for you, in any way we can help you, would you come as together we stand and sing. Amen.